In the Gospel today, Jesus Christ is trying to talk about two different ways of praying, and he's trying to address a certain crowd of people, those who thought that they were justified and who despised other people. Then he picks two particular characters and tells a story, and he picks them for a reason. The Pharisee is one of the many subdivisions of the Jewish people. A Pharisee was one of those that started out really as a very pious, kind of a traditional group, in fact, within the Jewish people, at a time when they were being pushed by foreign powers to collapse, to give in on matters of religion, to leave their faith. The Pharisees banded together as those who would keep the law, and that was a good thing. But as time went on, they started to keep lots of laws, laws they made up for themselves, until they reached a point where there were over a thousand different little laws that they kept, and they looked down on other people who didn't keep them. So the word Pharisee isn't a compliment. It was given to them by their fellow Jews, and it means someone who is separated from the others. They separated themselves from strangers, and they looked down on so many of their own brethren that they became a little class unto themselves. The publicans are another subdivision of the Jewish people. A publican is a tax collector. Of course, especially around April, we don't care much for tax collectors. But these tax collectors had a special thing that was not in their favor. They worked for foreign government. So imagine if you would, that we'd been taken over by some other country, maybe China, and the Chinese controlled the taxing system, and there were some Americans who worked for the Chinese government as the tax collectors. And the tax collection system was this. They were given a quota of tax. Once they collected the quota, the rest was theirs to keep. You understand now why the publicans were not well-liked. The Pharisees despise the publicans as terrible sinners, traitors to the country, traitors to the Mosaic law. That doesn't mean that every tax collector was really a sinner. Some of them were very honest. Now our Lord says in his story that he is telling them, two men go into the temple to pray. And the Pharisee is the one who prays first. And he says, To God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. You see, that's the Pharisee's mindset. I'm not like other people. I'm not an adulterer, not a usurer, I'm not all these things. Or even like this publican. You can see, publicans were considered to be really down there, the lowest of the low, at least by the Pharisees. If you look at his prayer very carefully, the word I comes up quite a bit. I am not like this. I thank you that I am that. I tithe. I fast. Lots of reference to himself. He suffers from pride. And pride is that inability to see what you really are. Pride means you look at yourself and you see someone who's quite good. And so we see the Pharisee telling God how good he is. Now, he's thanking God for how good he is, but it's not really a very kind of humble prayer at all. And pride is a very dangerous thing, a very destructive thing. But it's not an obvious thing. It's not something that we see quickly at all. But it's the most dangerous of the seven capital sins. If you compare it to all the other things which we would consider to be really serious, Lust, anger, covetousness, envy, all of those. It wouldn't seem maybe as bad as the others, but St. Thomas Aquinas says it's the very worst of all of those. So much so that it causes a greater blindness inside of us than does anything else and leads us further astray. We only have to think of what it did to the most beautiful angel that God made, Lucifer, his name meant light bearer. Lucifer exceeded in intelligence and spiritual splendor all of the other angels. But unfortunately for Lucifer, he did sort of what the Pharisee did. He looked at himself 
and he saw what he was. But rather than thanking God in humility and realizing he could have been created as the least angel, he began to, in a way, worship his own excellence. And he turned away from God and became the worst of the demons. A terrible thing, what he is now. And we have to remember, pride did that to him. And so we have to be wary of it. St. Thomas Aquinas says, Pride is such a terrible thing that God, if you won't respond to any other grace and any other warning that he gives you, will actually let you fall into the most shameful sin so that you'll be humbled and humiliated. What's the most shameful sin? Lust. So God will actually allow you, he won't cause you, but he'll allow you to fall into some sin of lust to bring you down to an awareness of how weak you are and of what you're capable of doing if he's not there all the time holding on to you like a little child. That's why in the epistle it says, all these things come from God. It talks about various gifts and abilities that are given to people to help the church. But it keeps saying, they're from the same spirit. They're from the same spirit. Always from the same spirit. They're not from us. Not one of you has ever done a good thing on his own. And that might be hard to accept at first. But the scriptures tell us from our Lord's mouth, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. It's good to remember that. You've never done a good thing in your life without the help of God. You have no beauty, no intelligence, no ability, no virtue, unless it's from God. That's what the Pharisee had trouble seeing. Even though he said, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of men, the rest of his prayer was all about himself. Then we have the publican. The publican was so aware of his sinfulness, he stood in the back of the temple. He didn't even want to get close to the altar of God, to the Holy of Holies. And he didn't even look up, but he looked down. The way you see the altar boys and the priests doing during the confidior when they confess their sins. And for the altar boys, they're confessing for the sinfulness of everyone that's at the Mass. In the confidior, you strike your breast through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. And that's what the publican did. He had his eyes down. And he beat his breast. And all his prayer was, was, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That was his whole prayer. Not a single mention of virtue. You notice the Pharisee didn't ask for anything at all? Nothing. He didn't seem to need anything. He was completely convinced of his own beauty inside. The publican felt what he was. He knew he was lowly. He knew he had done wrong. And he wanted the mercy of God. And his prayer was acceptable to God. That's why Jesus said at the end of the story, that man went away justified. What does that mean? You've probably, if you're accustomed to attending the old Mass, how many summers have you heard this gospel? He went away justified rather than the other. It means he was in the state of grace. God gave him grace, forgave his sins. He was sorry And he wanted God's mercy, and he got it because he was humble. But the other man did not get grace from God. He didn't even ask for it. And he went away just as evil as he was before, and he didn't know it. What a terrible thing pride is. It makes you blind. But there's a warning in all this from our Lord because when the world goes bad, it's easy to look good. And it's easy to see what you are and to realize you're doing better than other people are doing. And it's very important to give all the credit to God all the time. It's not wrong to see that your family is doing okay, at least for now. But never presume that it will always be that way. Never assume that your children will never go bad, because they might. Never assume that you'll always be as virtuous as you are, And maybe you're not as virtuous as you think. It's important to be humble. I'm not saying when you come to church, sit in the back pew and don't look up. But be humble in your heart. 
knowing that every day, if you do well that day, it's because God had mercy on you and he didn't let your sinfulness overwhelm you. You know, when the devil comes to tempt us, it's like a big bully harassing a little two-year-old child. The devil's intelligence and his power could overwhelm us immediately. But God doesn't let him. The devil's ability to cause physical destruction is amazing. If God let him, we'd all be dead now. I didn't fully understand that until I read a book, which I won't even give you the title of. I don't recommend it. It was written by a Christian preacher who, in college, kind of went off the deep end. He got into Satanism. And he was present at satanic worship. And, you know, they draw their little pentagram on the ground, and they're calling up evil spirits. One of the young men stepped across the pentagram into the space of the demon, if you will, and his chest was immediately crushed flat as a pancake. The power of the devil and his hatred for us. Realize it. Realize how he could cause you to sin and be very grateful to God for every good day you have. Humility, the opposite of pride, makes us beautiful in the eyes of God. Beautiful in the eyes of God. When we look at what happens to Our Lady, when she was told she would be the mother of the Savior, the greatest honor any human being could possibly be given in the history of the world, she praised God. She had nothing to say for herself. She magnified the greatness of the Lord. Why? Because he had looked at the humility of his handmaid. And then she said, Behold, all generations will call me blessed. God loves humility in us. It's an interesting thing. What happens to people who are becoming saints? What kind of graces they get from God? And what the soul becomes as a result of those graces. So the kinds of things that we're talking about would be saints who get wrapped into prayer and they can pray for an hour, two hours, three hours, and then it ends and they don't know that time has passed. That would be a lower form. A higher form would be when they're actually lifted up off of the floor. Ecstatic flight, you see it in some of the lives of the saints where they lift up off of the floor. St. Joseph of Cupertino, for example, or St. Teresa of Avila, who would make the other nuns hold her down. All of those incredible things, visions and all the rest, they always come with a great increase of humility from God. So the saint, after experiencing something which, if we experienced it, would make us very proud, has an even lower opinion of himself afterwards. Why? He sees the greatness of God, and he realizes, compared to God, he's just nothing. That's what God wants us to come to him in prayer like, to realize what we are, how small we are, how weak we are, how we're beggars, but also we're his children. When you come to God, you're not like a poor man coming in front of a miser, but you're like a poor child coming to his father, and your father is infinitely rich and infinitely loving. If you have humility in your heart, he can give you a great deal. And he wants to, and he will. St. Teresa of Avila said, as soon as we give God space in our hearts, he comes into our hearts that much. But if you're proud, there's no space for him, and he can't come in. The Pharisee got nothing from his prayer. The publican received the mercy of God. If we look at the Magnificat of Our Lady, Again, it says, He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich He sent away empty. Those people who are rich inside, who are content with themselves already, who think they've got everything they need, 
They get nothing in prayer. Those who come to God broken and aware of their sins and knowing how needy they are and begging God for his mercy and his love, they receive that love. That's the message of the gospel today. God bless you.